Long COVID might be a new disease only just about to nudge its second birthday, so it's to be expected that the textbook chapter on it hasn't been written yet. But what if I told you that another condition just like it has been around for decades? Yes, step up ME and CFS. But before you get your pitchforks out, I'm not here to argue that they're the same condition, just one that we can learn a lot from. We may yet find a shared mechanism, either in whole or in part. And I'm going to stick my neck out and say that long COVID research should look long and hard at the decades of ME research because many lessons have already been learnt. In this film, I talk to Ron Tompkins, MD, Chief Medical Officer of the Open Medicine Foundation and Co-Director of the ME-CFS collaboration at Harvard-affiliated hospitals, to find out just what we do and don't know about ME-CFS, and how relevant those lessons might just be for long COVID. Topics include the current favourite, microclotting, along with mitochondrial dysfunction, gut microbiome, MCAS, dysautonomia, and that old chestnut, the HPA axis. Hope you find it useful. It, it seems mad, like madness to me that with all the dozens of research projects that are being funded by the NIHR in the UK, no one seems to have gone, OK, <laughs> like we've got decades of research and something really similar let's look at what we know and let's build on that and no one's done that at all it's it's kind of preposterous and i don't know if it's any different in the states there was a, a serious mm, lurch in the uk in the 70s in which um psychiatry took the forefront with respect to um the field of me and it and it became more of a notion of motivation and, uh, and therapies along those lines that would address m motivational issues. This disease, they are very in intent to improve their lives. They have the very best motivations, but the fact is that they just physically can, or the consequences if they do are dire. Uh, much of what was funded were along those lines, which uh, frankly, to my opinion, had not been that fruitful. One of the things that we do seem to have some evidence for in MECFS is the down regulation of the HPA axis. And this has been sort of an interesting topic for a few people in the long COVID community to look at and wonder if the same thing is happening uh, with us as well. I was wondering if you could just describe, um, describe for us what the HPA axis is um, and what research has been done around that and what the current understanding is around that with MECFS? Uh, the endocrine system is um, an opportunity where hormones, which are just small peptides, uh, to affect very many of our activities, for example, thyroid and adrenal gland function. And there's a very important area in the, uh, it's a part of the brain, that for, for brain, it's a very important, more recently developed area of the brain that, uh, has uh, small molecules that influence and a very adjacent tissue, the pituitary. And there's so many important hormones that come from the pituitary and into the bloodstream and affect adrenals and, and uh, the adrenals in terms of your uh, corticoids, uh, um, uh, adrenaline, uh, energy, all kinds of important things. Thyroid, obviously, is a, is a gland that's very important about energy. But there are multiple other hormones that, that are influenced in that manner. But the downregulation of, of a hypothalamic pituitary axis, which is what HPA is, is these hormones are not functioning at a normal level. And they don't there's a there's in some instances a positive feedback and sometimes a negative feedback between these multiple small molecules, but it is a great deal of, of of our essence and the way that we address life is highly functioning HPA axis, just at a high level. Stress influences that tremendously, and the failure to recover from that stress. Um, the result, in, 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 in addition to multiple systems, is the HPA axis. What are the symptoms of uh, an HPA axis that is not functioning correctly? What would you notice? 
for your uh, corticoids. That is the adrenal, the outer layer of the adrenal system. And normally uh, you get a corticoid response at the very end of sleep. So when you wake up in the morning is often when you have your greatest energy and it's because of corticoids, but it also can invert so that your energy comes at an odd time, like in the evening. But that's not the normal human uh, circumstance. It's certainly, I can speak for myself and a lot of other long haulers I know when I say that we wake up in the morning wrecked not feeling fresh and full of energy, which may be connected to some sort of dysfunction there. Uh, uh, yeah, like the inversion. Yeah. So your natural um, clock has become either erratic or inverted. Either is a problem. Moving on to probably the hottest topic of the moment in long COVID, which is... Um, this uh, discovery of micro clotting um, in the long haulers' blood and uh, hyperactivated platelets, um, which have been found as well. So this is by Professor Rezia Pretorius in South Africa and her team, and she's had papers published on this. Um, is there anything we know about abnormal uh, clotting in any form in ME or CFS? Has this ever been reported on before? Or is there anything to do with blood function that's been noticed before in ME and CFS? In terms of microcirculatory clotting dysfunctions, there really has not been, to my mind, much done about that with ME, frankly. Yeah. I know it's, yeah, I know it's a hot topic in COVID. Yeah. Hematologists have not been particularly interested in ME. I think some of the research that's being done at the moment around long COVID is also including a few ME patients in the cohorts as well. So we'll get some um, information back on what they've found in their blood as well and how different it is or not to the long COVID blood. So, I mean, again, these are small, small cohorts at the moment, but it's very interesting. Um, so, so the next thing I sort of want to move on to, which is sort of connected to this, is uh, metabolism. And one of the things that seems to be again, dysfunctional in, in long COVID patients is, is their metabolism at potentially a cellular level. Um, and there's suggestions that there might be uh, anaerobic cellular metabolism, which again is much less efficient than normal aerobic metabolism for the cells. And I was wondering if there was anything on this level that had ever been investigated with regards to ME. Oh, there's a lot. Most, much of it is about an inefficiency of, um, of oxidation of many of the, for example, um, we, we are carbon oxidizers and the way we do it and, and the efficiency with which we do it is uh, for different tissues is very different. And, but in general, a reduction in that efficiency is something that's been associated with ME. And I think the extent to which it's been nailed in a, in a very comprehensive way, is lacking. And uh, it's one area that I think needs tremendous emphasis. And uh, I, your, your mention of, of that, uh, we've been looking at invasive uh, cardiopulmonary exercise testing, ICPET, and what we are finding in many ME patients is a what looks to be a poor oxygen extraction in their peripheral tissues. And we're finding exactly the same thing in uh, long COVID patients. Yeah. I think my, my personal opinion, there, there are going to be uh, two versions of the same disease. Um, I have a theory, which I would like you to either shoot down or, or encourage um, regarding post-exertional malaise. And my theory about why the fatigue is so uh, crushing when you have, you know, when you have overdone it and the following day or whenever it is that it hits you is that when you've basically been overdoing it, you've been spending your supplies of ATP that your body then is unable to replenish in the way that it normally would. Um, and, you know, again, due to mitochondrial dysfunction or whatever. Um, so, you know, at some point down the line, your body then realizes it doesn't have enough energy to fuel its you know, fundamental, you know, or, organ processes. So your gut, your kidneys, your liver, your brain, whatever. 
Um, and that's part of the reason why you crash then. And this fatigue is so utterly crushing because you simply do not have, at a very simple level, the fundamental energy to run your body in a normal way. Um, and again, that's a consequence of metabolic dysfunction. I, was, I just thought I'd put that past you to see if that sounds feasible or preposterous. And it's a very attractive hypothesis. Mm. Um, all, all I can say right at the moment is that hasn't, the, the, uh, what you're talking about is sort of the redox condition of individual cells. And uh, just to take, for example, skeletal muscle would be a very critical uh, tissue to understand its redox state. Um, and uh, that hasn't been done definitively in ME and it's, it's complex. Um, and I think it's something that, that must be understood better. And uh, I, what I'm hoping is that the resources that are coming out of post COVID, the 1.1 billion, um, that there'll be some studies of that in long COVID that I feel will be very, very directly applicable uh, yeah. for the yeah. ME patient. But it's a very attractive hypothesis. It's a complex matter of, of how mitochondria uh, control the redox level. And so this mitochondrial dysfunction has been an intriguing but not well identified uh, for ME. Mm. And uh, we're certainly interested in that. So it's not preposterous. I'm not sure it'll be that simple. No, no um, nothing is. So moving on to my next topic, which again is one of the uh, areas that people are interested, interested in with, with long COVID. Um, is there anything that we know about the function of the gut and the microbiome in MECFS and any degree to which that is not functioning as it maybe should or would be expected to? Um, I have a similar answer to that. Um, the microbiome is a common, it, it's, a, it's a very popular uh, topic. And when you study it in many individuals, I, many with MECFS have changed their diet and their lifestyle to such an extent, it's not normal. But then you're trying to associate a consistent abnormality with the syndrome, with the disease. And it's not consistent, frankly. And then when you try to intervene with it, um, reconstituting the microbiome of, of the gut, it's quite transient and um, it often lasts maybe two weeks and there may or may not be improvements, but it, it, to date, there really has, it hasn't been an answer. Again, that would be a, a really simple, I you think, thing to do, but, and, and it certainly needs more, uh, very consistent uh, study, but I, from what I've seen so far, it, it is, there are inconsistent differences, which makes it hard to interpret. Yeah, um, and the next one I would like to ask you about is um, sudden onset um, intolerances or allergic reactions, um, and is there a link with mast cell activation in ME? I think there's definitely mast cell activity here. And I particularly think it, it is uh, aggravating the neural inflammation, um, which is an area of tremendous interest. Just in general, mast cells are present behind the blood-brain barrier. They do strongly influence both microglia and astrocytes. And the level of, of neural inflammation is, is sort of where I think mast cells clearly play a role. Uh, but they could also in the GI tract as well. I mean, they, they cause havoc there. And, been... and, and, and enhanced sensitivity of mast cells from whatever trigger is uh, clearly part of, the, part of the problem in many patients, maybe not all. So do you find patients who respond well to changing their diet to be low histamine diet, for example? I mean, for me, I've discovered that you know since having long covid i suddenly am incredibly sensitive to any minor amounts of histamine in what i eat even a cup of tea for example and my skin will blow up like inflamed within like five minutes um let alone if i were to have like a spicy curry which would just like explode me completely <laughs> so um is, is that something that's also seen in me patients as well yes yeah absolutely and um 
it to me it seems that mast cells have um, in in different tissues have a different sensitivity level that it is way more sensitive and it has not recovered from that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the issue would be, is there a therapy that you could derive that would address this change in sensitivity? That to me would be beginning to, and it's not going to be the same in every patient. But One of the few things that doctors in the UK are actually prescribing um, if they're relatively well informed, is H1 and H2 blockers. And those do seem to, I mean, I'm on those, fexofenadine and famotidine, and that really does help me get through <laughs> my day in a way that isn't really uncomfortable. Um, I don't know if they're... So it's commonly... like 20 milligrams of famotidine twice a day, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Mm, good. Um, is there any research on that in ME? Has anybody actually looked at that? Not, well, to be totally honest, not really. Mm. Not in a, in a very systematic way. You know, it's um, in, in very often a, a much of the, many of the investigators are interested in what they do. And so you would be talking about a mast cell um, scientist who may or may not have consistently tried it on ME patients. But in, in those cases, you know, it depends. They have to have well-characterized ME patients to study. Mm. If, and then so, you know, it, it requires a center where you have very well-defined patients and you have multiple investigators who are expert in the areas of their interest so that, so that you have not only the good science about mast cells, but you also know the patients are, are really in the patients. So, and that, that requires an infrastructure and, you know, consistency and planning and that just rarely exists. And, and mass cell research is hard at the best of times. You know, the, I think oh, the chemical correct. mediators are a nightmare because they disappear after 30 seconds and yeah. yeah. They're all local. Yeah. Um, and so one of the other things that we're seeing a lot of in long COVID is dysautonomia and POTS. Is this something that's also frequently seen in ME and CFS as well? Absolutely. It, it's not all, and I, if I were to give you, it depends on the referral population if you wanted to know what the incidence would be, but certainly in a third or more, uh, either dysautonomia or orthostatic, orthostatic intolerance is, uh, can be a prominent feature. And has there been any research on that? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. There, there, there's some very good people that have been involved um, in, in both, honestly. And where's, is there anything that's come out of that that's been a, either something that was learned a long time ago and has been forgotten about or a breakthrough that needs to be followed up on? There is a important information about the, the dysfunction that occurs between the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems that uh, create many of the symptoms. And there's beginning to be investigations with respect to what is off the shelf known drugs and how they might improve that imbalance. And that's on the venous side of the circulation, but also on the arterial side of the circulation, there's a um, peripheral resistance controlling uh, part of, of our bodies that, that are uh, controlled by small non-myelinated fibers. And uh, in many of these patients, there is a really loss of that innervation. Um, the good thing about that is that there are drugs now being, that have been developed primarily for migraine headaches um, that are now possible that might be useful in some patients who are suffering from this uh, small fiber neuropathy. And I think that's an area that really needs considerable investigation. And then secondarily, there are also a lot of mitostokers uh, that many pharmaceuticals are, um, have developed that uh, address mitochondrial dysfunction. And I think those are uh, some possibilities. Now, it, 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 it would be foolish to use these on all patients. Uh, and so you not only need, you need to have a diagnostic test that says 
in this patient, this is they're at risk for benefit if this drug were to work. So if you go study just a whole group of uh, patients with ME with a drug for mitochondrial stoking, you know, you, the only chance you have to help is that subset for which their mitochondrial disease is contributing to their symptoms. And so you, you really need to be selective of your patient population. And then, uh, and that's what we need. So just in terms of the risk factors, if I describe what we seem to see with long COVID in terms of who is seems to be um, overrepresented amongst long COVID patients, the group would be predominantly female uh, by a ratio of about two to one. Um, age wise, 30 to 50, although there's a, a, quite a few people younger as well. Um, there are a few risk factors which aren't so much things like uh, pre-existing poor health, um, but people who are particularly athletic or highly trained before also seem to be overly represented. Um, if, if you were in any way a topic, so, uh, you know, suffering from eczema, hay fever, asthma, or any even minor levels, uh, you are more likely to feature any prior post-viral fatigue, um, and then things like uh, EDS, um, fibromyalgia, and IBS. So conditions like those also seem to be overrepresented in the cohort. I, I have a feeling that it might be similar in ME, but I was just wondering if you could respond to that. I thought you were reading about ME, but that's exactly ME. <laughs> right. No, I thought they just, yeah. I, no, I, that's just I what had, we've seen with long COVID. I had, yeah, I have just, I, I uh, uh, it's exactly the same. Um, and what I'm really struck by is the, their past histories is, is not their life. Prior lifestyle was, if anything, uber active, not hypoactive. Yeah. And 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 the very first question you ask, you know, if if I had a magic wand and I could just make this go away, what would you do? And the answer, they know exactly what they would do. Go back to their prior life. And it has to do with running or climbing or doing something that it is, you know, is very, um, very, very active. And, and so it has nothing to do with depression. No. <laughs> no, clearly. Does that tell us anything about what the mechanism might be, given the people who are predisposed to suffering from it? Females actually have a, a in general, a more vigorous um, immune system. Um, and so there are multiple things that are, I mean, autoimmunity is more closely related to uh, females than males. Um, and there's, there are many arguments about why there is a difference. Uh, one of the more popular ones is testosterone is a little immunosuppressive. And so that might contribute to the lower frequency of males, um, but atopic diseases uh, clearly, the immune system is triggered uh, to be more responsive than than might be an optimal. Um, so, it, it, it if I were to give any kind of generality, it is a, uh, a exuberant uh, response to the immune system, which is inappropriately high. You know, many ways um, tolerance of, of the immune system for many things is a very important um, control for health. Sometimes over exuberant responsiveness is just as bad as ignorant, ignoring pathogens or things. And talking about autoimmunity, that this must have been a subject that's been researched in ME and CFS. What is there anything that's come out of that research that is of consequence? Uh, there are multiple excellent investigators who are looking at particular autoimmune antibodies. Um, that exist in the in the peripheral uh, circuit and um, some in the central nervous system, but there's very few actually in the CSF. Um, and uh, there's a number of them that are against some of the neurotransmitters and that um, do seem to be. Unfortunately, they're not present in every, in every one of the patients, but in some patients they're prominent and 
there is a similar investigation and in, similar investigations are ongoing uh, with respect to long COVID um, that are, and frankly, many of them are, are quite similar. And so the issue that is of particular uh, concern is the various types of antibodies that are generated by the virus or, the, or your immune system's response to the virus. I mean, it's a 38 KB uh, virus and there are mm, uh, dozens of epitopes for which antibodies are, are being developed. And it's possible that some of those epitopes uh, create an antibody that has cross-reactivity to natural uh, components of our, of our bodies. And that is contributing to disease. And so that's an area of very active interest in, in long COVID. Um, and it has been studied quite a bit in ME, um, not definitively, but quite well. And of what is known, there's a great deal of overlap. Yeah, I mean, there's- So it's very promising. So I don't know if you've heard about the Berlin Cures team in Germany yes. who had the BC007 drug, which again yeah. seems yeah. to implicate there being an autoimmune role in this. And again, I think yeah. they're waiting to get that trial started, but it's been put back and it's going to be into next year and everybody's been waiting for it because it seems to be so promising. Um, yeah. Well, we were very interested to help help with that, and but um, uh, didn't receive any mutual enthusiasm. <laughs> yeah. Um, so speaking about research, if you had infinite resources um, and someone just came to you, if Elon Musk came to you and said, I would like to help you do the research project of your dreams, what would that be for you? Oh, my. I hadn't, uh, hadn't I'm thought about that. I'm putting on the spot. That. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Uh, I... It, it, have uh, in, in my prior uh, interest with injury research is um, a very consistent center uh, and a collection of centers so that there's uniformity in patients and uniformity to uh, study protocols. And so I'm rather than any single study, I would like a system to um, make things more um, consistent and, and precise across multiple centers so that when you do study something, you know definitively its, its impact. And if, if, if I were to receive that kind of support, that would be the very first thing I would do. And, and then, I mean, there's so many immunometabolic and autoimmune and other pathophysiologies that I would study, but it would be with large numbers and a bunch of people who knew exactly what they were doing so that you wouldn't have to redo any of these studies. They were definitive. We did, we did that with uh, injury and spent a hundred million dollars and to understand the uh, genomics and proteomics of injury. And I think a lot of those results are very relevant to MECFS, but they were clearly definitive. We thousands of patients and a hundred million dollars. Well, that's well, that's what it takes, isn't it? Um, and that's exactly what we need here. Yeah, yeah, it's mad, right? You've got 1.1 billion announced by the U.S. government. But I don't know how much of it's actually been pledged or how much of it's actually in play. I mean, it's... they just announced today um, they're going to do 25 supplements uh, to people who are already funded in other topics, um, and, and that's their expansion. Their first was just creating these clinical and pathological cohorts. So I, I have no idea. Uh, most of their clinical cohort studies are questionnaires. And I mean, that was the approach with ME forever. I mean, if, if let's say there was a, a textbook chapter on, uh, on ME that was going to be written at the point at which we understood it as well as we understood, I don't know, rabies or, or something that we understand. Um, assuming that we do understand rabies, I'm not entirely sure, but, um, yeah. but if, if let's say you've got that textbook chapter, how much is that textbook chapter filled out, if at all, in the last sort of 10, 20 years? Are we still kind of at 
were we at 10% then? Are we at 12% now? Or have we actually glad you, decent progress? I'm glad you said 10%. Right. That was exactly what came to mind. Mm. Yeah. And we're still down at the sort of the 10%-ish area. We haven't, we haven't sort of made a huge yeah, inroad. You know, I, just, I, I think that if we had paid more attention to it and financially supported it and created a consistent evaluation of it, we wouldn't be in this long COVID mess. Honestly, yeah, I completely agree. I mean, the only, I guess, positive from that is that there is a hope that with the attention and resources that are being put in as a result of long COVID, that cracking long COVID might mean cracking MECFS too. Um, so that's the optimistic. <laughs> well, that's my, that's my hope too. But mm. there's no there there are, at, at least today there's I I don't know of anyone who's uh, actively involved in um, that endeavor that has any experience with MECFS. And and that's my concern. But I think despite themselves, they will find things that are contributory to ME. (laughs) And and this is kind of why I wanted to have this chat, which is why is there not more of this going on between the two communities? It seems in terms of working out how to address it and where to look next. It, it, it seems potty to me, but. Uh, the field of ME has, um, has strong supporters and it has very strong detractors mm. that are inherent in m- many of the institutions. And uh, that is such a challenge that um, uh, that the community has not been able to overcome. And so, I mean, that's as nicely as I can say it. <laughs> and, 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 and I think- Strong, that's... strong ladder to follow. <laughs> yeah, there's, um, I, I think that's one of the reasons why the ME has a stigma to some degree and, to some, and also why the long COVID community has been slightly wary of maybe reaching out more to the ME CFS is because they don't want to, get the same stigma that they've seen the ME and CFS communities have. And so there's been a, a, a proportion of long COVID uh, patients who have been saying, no, it's long COVID's different, it's its own thing. <laughs> Whereas, but, yeah. No, I totally, I, yeah. I completely agree. It, it's just so wrong uh, this, that there is any stigma that's associated with it. it it's, uh, it's very frustrating for me. I came from a field where No one likes to think they would be injured, but eventually we overcame that and and have received extraordinary resources to understand the disease. And as a a result, the likelihood of dying uh, is less than half of what it was 20 years ago. I mean, it's the the entire outlook outcomes are very different. And, And yet in this field, this disease can destroy the rest of your life. Having And I'm struck by the young people who are very vigorous and then suddenly just slammed and are struggling to get back to have their life when it should be they're young and everything should be working perfectly fine. And I mean, I find that a huge problem. And it's, it's not something in your head. It's something very physical and it's something that we should be understanding. It's a human condition. And I just find this atrocity. Yeah. I mean I, that's I why I'm that's why I'm involved. Yeah. Period. A huge thanks to Dr. Ron Tompkins for his time and expertise, and I hope that you found that discussion interesting. I certainly hope that the long COVID and MECFS communities can work together going forwards without any worries about stigma, because I can't help but feel that our fates are intertwined, whatever happens next on the research and treatment front. Look after yourselves until next time.